Tom Harbin University Book Club. Today we're reading from Edward Nell's new book, Progress and Poverty in Economics. The subtitle, Henry George and How Growth in Real Estate Contributes to Inequality and Financial Instability. This is from the introduction, uh, which is subheaded, uh, Reviving the Work of America's Most Original Economist. Andrew Mazzone and I collaborated on a project to review the work of the 19th century American economist Henry George especially his landmark book, Progress and Poverty, 1879, to see how George's wor work stood up in the light of modern economics and to determine what could be brought up to date and applied to the contemporary world. We wanted to establish that George's work was relevant and also to criticize American academics, uh, academic econo economists for having overlooked or rejected George, both in his own time, when his work was a worldwide sensation, and afterward, even today. Andrew died suddenly in the middle of the project. This book is a tribute to him and completes what we began. George began his career as a, an author and public personality with progress and poverty, arguing that progress brought poverty in its wake and that poverty might even outpace progress, an important original point of view that has not been lost, that has not lost any of its relevance since George's time. In fact, in our age of burgeoning inequality, it may be more relevant today than ever before. The grounds for this paradoxical interlinking of progress and poverty lay in the effect of rising rents. For George, rents were payment, not for the use of land in the usual sense, but for pure access to specific places and locations. But why should some people have the right to limit others' access to the use of the earth? Surely it belongs to us all. Worse, the limiting of access by demanding payment would undermine the benefits of innovation and hard work. To prevent this linking of progress and poverty, George said a major policy shift in taxation was required. This is well known among economists as the George, Georgist single tax on rents, or the Henry George theorem. Since George's time, there has been progress, both in the economy itself and in economic analysis. The economy has been growing, and growth models have become highly sophisticated, in many cases focusing on matters that were central to George a century earlier. But that progress has also led to poverty, obvious in the economy itself. Our mainstream economics is also poverty-ridden, stricken. Our analytical models do not explain the persistence of poverty very well, nor do they account for crises and crashes, let alone the recent stubborn growth of inequality. The mainstream theory of income distribution, marginal productivity, which assumes diminishing returns for all these factors of production and the markets will coordinate their adjustment, Distribution is hopelessly flawed. George rightly rejected an early version of it. And contemporary economic theory has almost completely lost sight of rents and real estate. Even though real estate was center stage in the global financial crisis of 2008, a crisis directly resulting from speculation in the housing market. And in 2016, Donald Trump, a real estate developer whose rise to power is intimately linked to rents and real estate speculation, was elected president. With a solid Republican majority in Congress, he began to implement a set of relentlessly regressive trickle-down economic policies that can be expected to lead to more poverty among vast segments of the population. Andrew and I wanted to find insights and tools in George's thought to counter this trend, to support progress and alleviate poverty. Before Andrew died, we had settled on five main points in George's writing that we, want to, we wanted particularly to explore. One. George emphasized cooperation as well as competition in regard to increasing productivity. He saw that the division of labor and cooperation as settlements developed on new land, created value in location, and generated increases in output while bringing about innovation. This is what generated the differentials on which rent is based, as we will explain. Number two, George and his followers claimed that the total value of land in a region would tend to equal the value of the aggregate output of that region. Three, further they claimed that total rents would tend to equal the costs of government so that taxing rents would pay for government. And num number four, they contended that unless prevented by an activist government, inequality in wealth and income, roughly between the upper and lower classes, but also between other significant groups, would tend to rise inexorably. And number five, and finally, George repeatedly attacked land speculation and its tendency to withdraw land from productive use and to promote concentration, a point that seemed to 
that seemed to both Andrew and myself to have a direct bearing on today's world. Only, only today is not land alone, but finance generally that is subject to speculative excesses. I wrote up north notes on theory while Andrew worked on rents, cost of government, land values, and GNP. I eventually put our notes together into two more or less finished articles to present at the annual conference of the Eastern Economics Association in New York City. Economists have given George short shrift, which is a shameful oversight. He has much to teach us. He was uniquely American, perhaps our greatest economist, certainly not our most, certainly our most original. He is justly famous and heralded in the 19th century, and his book Progress and Poverty, which is the source for much of our analysis on these pages, was the best-selling book on economics of that entire century. The book Progress and Poverty in Economics by Edward Nell.